grace, mercy, and peace, these are the gifts that are yours from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the parable that Jesus tells today, this very explicitly clear parable, we have no misunderstanding or no mystery about what this parable is about today. In this parable, Jesus puts forward a simple question. What will he do? What then will the owner of this vineyard do? And as we sit here and think about what this owner would do, we we might think, what would we do? What should we do? What is the proper response to the way these tenants have treated the owner's servants, the owner's son, and ultimately the owner himself? What should the owner do as a result? Well, nothing the owner has done so far fits our way of doing things, so to ask what we would do, well, it's a far cry from what the owner will do. After all, after the first servant returned back to his owner, beaten and empty-handed, what would you do in that situation? After one servant was treated so poorly, so badly, wouldn't that be it for the tenants? Shouldn't that have been the end of their time in the master's vineyard? What would you do? Sue them? Bring them to the court of law? Certainly drive them out of that vineyard, never to see the, the good graces of that vineyard again? Or would you give them similar treatment? Would you beat them just as they beat your servant? But not this owner. No, this owner sends servant after servant after servant to try and get his word to them. This owner, probably unlike many of us, is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Love. This owner loves these tenants, and he shows them great mercy and grace by sending them servant after servant after servant. You see, there was a perception, perhaps, by these tenants that the owner had moved to another country, and therefore he was far off. He was disengaged. He really didn't care about what they did with his vineyard. But the owner was not as far off as they supposed. The owner was very present through his servants, through these ambassadors that he had sent, these messengers that he gave them in order to bring back his share of the fruits of the vineyard. He is present through these servants, and after they are rejected, he makes, him, he's make, he makes his presence known through his own son, his own beloved son. Now, like I said, unlike some parables, the meaning of this parable is explicitly obvious. The master, the owner, sends his beloved son. Well, where else have we heard these words? But from our Father in heaven, who says at Jesus' baptism, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And what did those tenants do? They killed him. They killed the beloved son of the vineyard's owner. And so Jesus asks the question, what will this owner do now? 
what would you do? We are all familiar with the familiar words of John 3.16. We've probably memorized these words of John 3.16. But when you put John 3.16 in the context of this parable, it shows you just how gracious and merciful our Heavenly Father, the Master of the Vineyard, is indeed. For God so loved the world, he so loved the tenants of this world, that he sent his only son. He sent him. He sent him knowing exactly how they had treated the prophets before him, how they had treated God's servants, how they had rejected prophet after prophet. They had beaten them, killed them, and rejected their word. And so this father, our Heavenly Father, sends his own son to meet the same fate, so that anyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. He sent his only son. Now in our way of doing things, this sounds absolutely insane. We might say it was moronic. After all, the owner of the vineyard had to know what they were going to do. But we don't call this insane or moronic. Rather, we call this grace and mercy. To believe in Jesus is to receive him and his word. Those who rejected Jesus rejected him because of his word. Look at how the tenants acted in this, in this parable. And look how those whom Jesus is talking to react to the parable. Jesus makes it explicitly clear that the rejection of him will lead to his death. If you reject the son, you will kill him. And they are so taken aback by this teaching so offended that they would that Jesus would have the nerve to say that they have rejected God's word so offended that they that that Jesus would say that they have rejected the son of God then what do they do they get together to plot to kill him to fulfill exactly what Jesus said they were going to do yes Jesus' words are fulfilled by these very people, the people who claim to believe that, that God is the only God. They claim to believe in God's word, and yet they reject the very servants, the very prophets, the very son who brings that word into their presence. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is no sixth Sunday in Lent. This being the fifth Sunday in Lent only leads to the end of our season of Lent. And next Sunday, it is not the sixth Sunday in Lent. No, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday begins that holy week, that week where Christ shows us once again his journey to the cross of Calvary. Palm Sunday marks Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On that day, that day, the people will cry, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will cry out with songs of praise and gratefulness. How will you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, receive our king when he comes how will you welcome him will it be with songs of hosanna or will it be with cries of crucify him is he the heir to the vineyard worthy of your praise and honor or is he an inconvenience does jesus get in the way of our plans is he trespassing on our vineyard? 
And when we ask these questions, we must remember that it is, in fact, not our vineyard. It belongs to God. <coughs> Jesus says that he will be the cornerstone. Even though he was the stone that the builders rejected, the stone that these faithful Jews rejected and put to death, he says this stone will become the cornerstone. And then he says, whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Imagine that you are a glass jar. And a glass jar falling upon a boulder will shatter to pieces. A boulder falling upon a glass jar will be shattered to pieces. Either way, the rock wins and the glass jar loses. Either way, the rock is victorious. And so when Jesus asked the question, what will the owner of this vineyard do? We must answer, he will win. He will triumph. He will have the last word. And we know that Jesus will win. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of his church, of this church, and he has come that you may be a part of it. He promises his church that, he, that, that the church will always be here on earth. The Christian church will not pass away. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Yes, the church will remain. But he does not promise that it will always remain here in Jonesville. If we are faithless, he will take our vineyard away and find more faithful tenants somewhere else. Similarly, we have talked about the book of Revelation, the letter to the seven churches, and Jesus says to those churches that if they do not repent, if they are faithless, he will remove their lampstand. And that is, of course, to mean that he will take the blessings of the church away from that particular place and move it to somewhere else where they will properly receive him. Yes, in Europe, where many of our ancestors came from, the church used to be great. The church used to be thriving. The churches used to be full. And now there are great stones, historical landmarks, of where these great vineyards used to be. The church here in America is in great danger of this as well. The church here in America may very well be rejecting the cornerstone of the church. May it not be so among us. May we be faithful. May we receive our king with shouts of Hosanna. May we not reject the one who has come to bring God's word to us. Indeed, it is through God's grace that he has called us to be tenants at all. It is by God's great mercy that he has chosen us to take care of the things that belong to him. And may God continue to show us his grace, his slowness to anger, and his abounding in steadfast love. May our Lord and our God continue to give us Jesus, the stone the builders have rejected, so that he may be our cornerstone as well, and that we may be grafted and built into him. May we always preach Christ crucified. May we preach about him who died, who was slain, who was killed, in order that we, might be saved in order that our sins might be forgiven. There is an irony in the people's statement 
when they see the son come into the vineyard, they say, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Again, the irony here is that Jesus is in fact the heir. He is the only begotten son of God, the beloved son of God. And yet by his death, indeed, we are inheritors. We share in the inheritance that our Lord and our Heavenly Father has given to us. It is by the death of this Son that we have the promise of eternal life. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, receive your King. Receive the Son of the Master of the Vineyard, that by believing in Him, you may not perish, but have everlasting life. In the name of Jesus, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.